Good morning, CCS. Welcome to chapel. Dear God, I pray for all the people that don't have a home, all the people that are in need, for this lovely day that you have given us. I hope that someday everybody will find the life that they've always been dreaming of. Amen. Good morning, CCS. Next week is our Spirit Week to celebrate our lap of fun. Make sure you're getting those donations in. Monday, to start off Spirit Week, November 2nd, we have Team Spirit Jersey Day. You can wear the colors or jerseys of your favorite college, professional, or local team that you support or have been a part of. Tuesday, November 3rd, is Distance Learning Day. There is no school on campus. Wednesday, November 4th is Patriotic Day. Wear your favorite red, white, blue, camouflage, or military appreciation shirts to show honor and support our military and our nation. Thursday, November 5th, that's our lap -thon. Come ready to run. Kindergarten through fifth grade, please wear a tie-dye shirt for the lap -thon. Middle schoolers, this is a whiteout day for you. Please wear a white t-shirt for the color run. For the lap -thon, uniform or khaki shorts can be worn. Um, and then Friday, November 6th, as parent-teacher conferences, there is no school. Fifth through eighth graders must be present for their parent-teacher conferences. During Spirit Week, jeans without holes or rips or tears are allowed, but shorts must be school-approved uniform, khaki, or gym shorts. Looking forward to an exciting week next week. Keep those funds coming in for the lap -thon. Jody, I am here to talk to you about the other four character traits that we are going to be discussing throughout um, the whole Lapathon fundraiser and rem reminding ourselves to um, glor focus on glorifying God, not only having fun during this fundraiser, but making sure that we are representing God well and being a good example to others. And um, so let's go ahead and get kicked off. Today, first one we're going to talk about is serving. And uh, serving is such an important part of being a Christian. And we follow Jesus' example of how he was a servant, first and foremost to us. And um, someone who was a king decided to be a servant to serve us and asked us to follow in his footsteps. So we want to make sure that we do that. And we look for opportunities to serve others, that we're not just thinking about ourselves and how we can be served. But maybe um, today you can think about what is something I can do to serve a friend or a member of your family or someone in your church or someone maybe you don't even know um, and think of a way that you can serve them just without expecting anything in return and um, so think about that maybe God will lay something on your heart um, let's see the next one is unwavering another word for this is perseverance um, this basically, uh, as it says on here, is when you set your mind to something, you um, see you see it through, which means you follow all the way through it. You don't give up. That's kind of what this means. It means you keep on going and you stay strong. And you can know that, you know, again, like I said last time, when God is for you, who can be against you? And you can accomplish anything, anything through God. And um, so we just want to remember that whatever we set our mind to, see it through, finish it through. And... Uh, so that will be a huge um, way to glorify God as well. Next one is to be hopeful. And as Christians, we are to always be hopeful um, and know that, you know, God is always there for us and that we can walk knowing that he has a good and perfect plan for us, as it says on here. Um, and one of my favorite verses also is Romans 8, 28, that says, um, that basically kind of paraphrasing everything, that, every single thing that happens to you, um, God is going to use that for good. So, um, you can rem remind yourself that even when bad things happen, we can know that God is ultimately going to use that for our good, for all of those who love him. He has a perfect plan 
And so we don't have to think, oh, is, does God even care about me? Is, does he know, you know, what does he even know what's going on in my life? Yes, he does. He knows every detail and he, he is going to work that in a way that is going to glorify himself and uh, be for your best interest and the interest of the rest of his children. Um, so keep that in mind that we can always know that we can trust God and his plan for us. Um, let's see, the final one for today is to be zealous, not jealous, but zealous. <laughs> and that means that we approach life with energy and zest, which means we are excited about life. We are not lazy, ho-hum, whatever. We, we really want to make sure that we are excited about life and excited about following God, glorifying God, um, serving others, all of these things. We, um... We just approach life with energy and passion and that when we do that, others notice it and it makes them ask, what is it about those people that cause them to have such joy and positivity and just um, energy for life? And a lot of times you can be a great witness to somebody for God uh, by them maybe even just asking you that question. What is it that makes you be so excited about life? And we always want to take advantage of those opportunities that we have to share um, God's love for us and uh, and his word with others. So um, just remember to go after life with, uh, to be zealous and, and to have a joyful life and let that show and show what God is doing in your heart. Um, so that's the last one for today. And I hope you guys have an awesome spirit week and laugh-a-thon. Hope you are raising money and telling people how awesome Charleston Christian is and uh, you're getting a lot of good prizes. So anyway, y'all have a great weekend. Here is the Apostles Creed as presented by the sixth grade class at Charleston Christian School. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen! This week, the Aslan Award goes to the class that did so well during one of Ms. Chandler's observations this week. She noticed they sat so quietly and listened so well. This week's Aslan Award goes to the second grade class. Congratulations. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Our chapel theme this year is the battle belongs to the Lord. This theme comes from 1 Samuel 17, 47. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. Good morning, CCS students. Hope you're having a great day so far. Uh, let me pray for us before we get started. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and for your goodness and the many ways in which you um, keep your promises and protect your people. Help us um, this year to know, to trust you more and to know more deeply that the battle belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, quick question as we get started. Have you experienced a challenging situation recently? Um, <laughs> I think most of us don't have to think too hard because we're all experiencing challenging times. Uh, for me, I experienced a challenging summer. My job was hard this summer. Uh, so many things happen behind the scenes and so many, many decisions are made over the summer in order to have school in the fall. 
And this summer, I had no idea if we were going to have school this fall. And yet the floors needed to be waxed and teachers needed to be hired and curriculum needed to be purchased. And additionally, uh, we had to create a reopening plan. It, it was a challenging situation. And we are still in a challenging situation. We're having to do everything differently. All of the procedures for going to school and going to church and just going to the store, they've all changed. And we don't know what the future holds. We don't know how long we're gonna be doing this. And so there's a lot of uncertainty, fear, and anxiety. Now, thankfully, we are not the only people in history who have experienced challenging situations. We're not the only people to have experienced uncertainty, fear, and anxiety. Sometimes we think we are, but if we look at history, if we look at the Bible, if we read the Bible, we'll see that others experience challenging situations just like us, and we can learn from them. Um, specifically today, we're gonna to talk about uh, King Hezekiah, um, a king of prayer, action, and faith. And um, the text that I used for this is Isaiah 36 through 37, Second Kings 18 through 19, Second Chronicles 29 through 32. So you can go back and read those if you would like. And the Bible records the life of Hezekiah, who experienced more than one challenging situation during his reign as king. And his, this account is found three times in the Bible, but it's not really a well-known story, or at least it's not as well-known as David and Goliath. Um, but so when Hezekiah became king, he inherited a really challenging situation. He inherited a mess. I would never want to be in the leadership position that he found himself in. So uh, what did he have to deal with? What was so difficult for him as king? So to fully understand what Hezekiah had to deal with as king, we need to know what was happening in Israel and in Judah right before Hezekiah became king. It was definitely a dark time in uh, Israel's history. It was a time where no one obeyed God's commands. It was a time that no one celebrated the Passover as they were required, or as the Lord wanted them to do every year. And they stopped worshiping in the house of the Lord. Now imagine not going to church for years and years on end. Actually, it might not be that hard to imagine given the pandemic that we've experienced. But imagine not going to church, not because there's a pandemic, but just because nobody wanted to go anymore. Imagine if all of your friends just stopped obeying God's commands. Imagine if all of your friends thought it was okay to lie and still. Imagine if all of your friends thought it was okay to harm each other. And imagine if your parents and if the adults that you knew didn't do anything to stop that from happening. Would you want to live during this time? I, I know I wouldn't. Now, not only did they stop obeying God's commands and worshiping the Lord as God commanded, they started to worship idols. And specifically, they made a bronze serpent and worshiped it as an idol. Now, how did God feel about his people worshiping other idols? Well, scripture clearly gives us an account of God's perspective on this. You know, we know it's one of the Ten Commandments not to make an idol, for, you know, first of all, only to worship the Lord, and then secondly, not to make um, an idol or graven image. But do you remember when the Israelites were worshiping the golden calf at Mount Sinai? What happened? Uh, they were punished. They were punished for their sin, and the Lord struck them with a plague. So do you think that the Lord punished the Israelites for forsaking his commands and worshiping an idol? Yes, and we will get to that in a minute. So as King Hezekiah wasn't just the military leader, he was also the spiritual leader. He had a hard job. And as leader, as the king, he had to address these challenges. He just couldn't ignore that people weren't going to the house of the Lord and um, worshiping idols. And so here's what, here are Hezekiah's actions. This is what he did. 
first of all, he opened the doors to the house of the Lord. He reinstituted worship. Um, he called people to worship the Lord in the house that was created for him. Um, then he reinstituted Passover. He, and lastly, he destroyed the idols. And the Bible tells us that all of those things that he did was right in the sight of the Lord. And that through it all, he trusted in the Lord. So Hezekiah addressed the spiritual challenges successfully and he pleased the Lord. Now, unfortunately, this was not the only challenge Hezekiah faced as king. Remember, the Israelites worshipped an idol. They worshipped the bronze serpent. And that, along with not obeying God's commands, resulted in God's judgment against the Israelites. So real quick, here's a map of Israel and Judah during this time. So Hezekiah is ruling Judah here in this, I guess this is the red part. This yellow part, this is the part of, uh, this is the Northern Kingdom, this is Israel, and this is what, this is the part that the people who live here are the ones who are gonna be punished. And he, God punishes the Israelites, everyone who lives in this region, um, through the Assyrian invasion. So what happens is um, the king of Assyria comes down to Israel, the northern kingdom, and he invades and he takes the people back to Assyria. They're forced to leave. So, uh, and during Hezekiah's 29 year reign, he saw the destruction of Israel, the destruction of the northern kingdom, by the Assyrians. So imagine uh, all of a sudden having to move with your family to a place you've never been before by force suddenly. You know, it's one thing to travel to a different country as a visitor on vacation, uh, but imagine living, leaving your home by force to go to a different country and never return. Well, that's what happened to the people of Israel. So when Hezekiah ruled in Judah, so remember he's, he's down here, but everyone who lives here, they know what happened to their neighbors in the north. Everyone who lived in Judah watched this happen. What were they feeling? What were they thinking when they witnessed this? Well, they were probably thinking, oh no, it's, it's just a matter of time until this happens to us. I imagine that they experienced uncertainty and fear and anxiety. Does that sound familiar? So the challenge Hezekiah faced was possible invasion and uncertainty. He had to prepare for the unknown. Now, none of us have had to protect a country from possible invasion, but we can all identify with facing uncertainty and preparing for the unknown. See, we're not alone. And during his reign, the threat of a possible invasion by Assyria became a reality. And by this time, there was a new king of Assyria. And he threw some shade at Hezekiah. And he said, this is what he says to him. He says, Hezekiah, you say that you trust God, but you're just saying that because Egypt supplies your chariots and horses. What is this confidence you have? I say your counsel and strength for the war are just empty words. So when Hezekiah heard these words, he tore his clothes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he ran to the house of the Lord. And Isaiah the prophet met him there and encouraged him. And then Hezekiah did three things in response to King Assyria's insult and threat. As a response, Hezekiah, he prayed, he took action, and he had faith. Here's Hezekiah's prayer. Now, O Lord, my God, I pray, deliver us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Then after he prayed that, he took action. He consulted with his military officials. He blocked off the water from the springs outside the city. Uh, they repaired the broken section of the city wall and they made a large number of weapons and shields. Like they knew a battle, they knew an army was approaching. They knew they had to be prepared for battle. And so you see they're 
He's a man of action. He gets other people involved and they take action knowing what is very likely to happen. And after all of this is done, Hezekiah, he gathers the people around him and the, being the man of faith that he's, he is, he says to them, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed because of the king of Assyria. With him is only an army of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Now, does this sound familiar? By the way, what is our chapel theme this year? Our chapel theme is the battle belongs to the Lord. Now, specifically, those are the words that uh, King David said. Um, but Hezekiah also believed it too. So what do you think happened? How did the Lord answer Hezekiah's prayer? The Lord said, I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. Isn't that amazing? The Lord absolutely delivered his people, and he did it all by himself. He didn't need Hezekiah's help in this. Hezekiah, he prayed, he took action, he had faith. And at the same time, the Lord won the battle. In the midst of an uncertainty, in the midst of crisis, the Lord was there. He was with Hezekiah and his people. Now, how do we respond in times of crisis and uncertainty? I wish I could say I always respond like Hezekiah, but there were moments over the summer where I just cried. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I'm human. We're all human. Um, but the hope and prayer, especially as we continue in uncertain times, is to grow into people of prayer, action, and faith. And how do we do that? How do we become people of prayer, action, and faith? Well, here's a question to think about. If Hezekiah knew in advance what God was going to do, would he be a man of prayer, action, and faith? Would he be walking by faith? And if the Lord knew that he would strike down the Assyrians, why did he allow King Hezekiah to do so much of the prep work? You know, I look back at this story and I think, that's a lot of hard work, making weapons, repairing a city wall, blocking off water supply, those aren't easy tasks. They take a long time and they take a lot of manpower to do it. Um, and clearly the Lord didn't need Hezekiah to do it. So why did he allow Hezekiah to do it? You know, why didn't the Lord stop him? You know, as Hezekiah was making weapons, why didn't the Lord come to him and say, hey, you know what, take a break. You don't need to worry about this. Go grab some water you know, I'm just going to come down and wipe out all the Assyrians for you. So I really don't need you to, to worry about this. Now, that would have been convenient for Hezekiah, right? But the Lord didn't do that. Why? Well, first of all, I don't presume to know the mind of the Lord. I can be wrong. Um, but here's the question. If Hezekiah knew in advance what God was going to do, would he be walking by faith? No. If Hezekiah knew in advance, would he need to pray about it? Well, no. If Hezekiah knew in advance, would he need to take action? No. And if he knew in advance, he wouldn't walk. He wouldn't have to walk by faith. He would be walking by sight. And, you know, that's not what we're called to do. We're called to do the opposite. We're called to do what's hard. We're called to walk by faith and not by sight. If we knew everything that would happen to us, we wouldn't need to trust the Lord. And I think we all want to know what's going to happen in the next few weeks or months or years, uh, but that knowledge doesn't belong to us. That knowledge only belongs to the Lord. You see, it's in the not knowing, it's in the uncertainty that drives us to trust the Lord and to put our faith in him and to pray 
and to take action um, and to have faith. We don't know the future, but we do know the one who holds the future and we can trust the one who knows the future. We can walk by faith and not by sight. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had to learn to trust the Lord to a, a greater degree these past six months. And the Lord has certainly delivered. You know, back in May and June when I was having a, a tough time, it would have been nice to have known then that everything was going to work out. It would have been great if the Lord said, you know, everything is going to work out. School will reopen. You're going to hire some great teachers. Um, and even though one of them is going to change their mind a week before school starts, I have that all worked out. I have two people to take her place. Um, the internet will go out again during the weeks before school starts like it has for the past three years, but I'll take care of that too. <laughs> First of all, it doesn't happen this way. God doesn't work this way, right? He doesn't tell us the future. That knowledge is not for us. And again, if, even if he did, hypothetically speaking, even if I could know the future, it would be so detrimental to me. It would be detrimental to me, for me to know the future. See, if I knew all of that in advance, what would I not have? Well, I wouldn't have any faith. I wouldn't grow in my trust of the Lord. I wouldn't grow in my thankfulness. Um, I wouldn't go to the Lord in prayer. You know, it, it's during times of prosperity when everything's working out that we have a tendency to not go to the Lord in prayer. We have a tendency to take things for granted and not be thankful. Um, I know for me, I've, I've always been thankful for church, but now that I didn't get to go for quite a long time, I am all the more thankful than I've ever been that I can go and worship. You see, it's not really about the ex situations we experience in life so much as it is about how we respond to the situations in life. And it's clear that we can honor the Lord in challenging situations in the very same way that uh, Hezekiah honored the Lord in a challenging situation by faith and prayer. And as we walk by faith and grow in our trust in the Lord, we are going to grow to have the confidence in the Lord like Hezekiah did. Um, do you remember the king of Assyria's insults? Let me remind you. Uh, it was actually kind of a compliment, even though he didn't mean it to be. Let's look at it again. The king of Assyria, he said, you say you trust God, but you're just saying that because Egypt supplies your chariots and horses. What is this confidence that you have? I say your counsel and strength for the war are only empty words. See, the king of Assyria, he recognized that Hezekiah had confidence in the Lord. And the king of Assyria learned the hard way that his confidence was in the right place. See, Hezekiah's words were not empty. Hezekiah was not trusting in Egypt. He was not trusting in their supplies. He really was putting all of his trust in the Lord. He was, as the Psalms, psalmist says, um, a righteous person who was not shaken. This is Psalm 112, 6 through 7. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast trusting in the Lord. Now, another word here for steadfast um, could be confident. Their hearts are confident in the same way that Hezekiah was confident in the Lord. Um, so as we walk through the uncertainty of a challenging situation, let's follow the example of Hezekiah. Let's pray. Let's um, take action. And let's grow in our faith and confidently trust in the Lord.